An introduction to botanical Latin, a uh, short version, an introduction. So classical Latin, that used by the Romans, is different in many respects from modern Latin and from scientific Latin in particular. In scientific Latin, the basic grammar and the basic syntax does remain, but much of the vocabulary is different. Uh, many terms were unknown to the Romans, and in particular in botanical Latin, uh, verbs tend to be omitted, making the style very telegraphic, and this then avoids one of the more difficult parts of the Latin language. So this short course will be giving you the basics of botanical Latin, so that when the time comes for you to compose a description or a diagnosis, it won't be so hard and it also gives you a basic introduction to Latin grammar. Bear in mind that um, early botanical Latin, say before 1850, is much more akin to classical Latin. And so early botanical Latin requires a wider knowledge of Latin grammar and assistance from a Latin scholar, or you need to go to uh, latinum.org.uk, uh, my website, and find the materials there for learning Latin um, I've been building up an audiobook catalogue and a course of audio uh, materials there for the last 10 years. So there's an enormous amount of material at latinum.org.uk for you to look at and help you learn Latin. And you can approach that in a um, very serious way or um, just dabble uh, with it. And even if you dabble, you'll end up learning a lot of Latin. So... Um, Whereas classical Latin is a dead language, or we could say a moribund language, as there are people that do speak it, but it's not a language that's alive in the sense that French or German is alive, botanical Latin is alive um, and kicking, um, and also has quite a large amount of Greek in it. Um, classical Latin does too, of course. Um, if you, for example, read Lucretius, you'll see that he struggles with certain words, and so he brings in Greek words to, to uh, work with concepts that were not present in Latin. So, and the Greek words that are brought into botanical Latin are then forced to behave like Latin words, instead of being declined in a Greek way. Uh, of course, the Romans did this too, um, and you find that there are Greek um, words in classical Latin which are declined according to the Roman pattern, and sometimes they're declined according to the Greek pattern. Um, so in botanical Latin, it tends to be uh, the twisting the Greek to fit the Latin, rather than leaving the Greek as Greek, as a general rule. Um, classical Latin has an alphabet of 23 letters, and uh, without the J and the U and the W, letter K only occurs in a few words, and Y, the, uh, the Y the, um, comes from Greek, um, and the letter U, pronounced as a vowel, um, represented by the V. Um, this came into use much later on when we got lowercase letters, although uh, Roman handwriting did have uh, a similar letter uh, in the cursive script. In botanical Latin, the entire English alphabet is used, and the letter J, the long I so-called, represents the consonantal, um, and the classical I, um, and pronounced like Y, um, in yes. So um, the word January, we pronounced Januarius, um, with the J being Y, and not using an I. Latin's a highly inflected language, which means that words change according to whether they are singular or plural. So flower and flowers in English, house and houses, but also the relationship of the word to the rest of the sentence, whether it's the subject of a sentence or the object, whether it's governed by a preposition and so on. This can be deduced from the ending of the word, its termination. In other words, the subject and object of a verb are not denoted by their positions relative to the verb in the sentence. And in English, 
this is an extremely important matter, right? The man kicked the dog and the dog kicked the man are not the same thing in English. Um, and in English, sentence construction is based on subject, verb and object in that order. Um, but the sense is incorporated into the nouns themselves. The boy picked the fruit. Um, if we said the fruit picked the boy, it would mean something completely different. And if we said picked the boy the fruit, we would be writing poetry. I mean, if we wrote the fruit the boy picked, we would also be writing poetry and it would be understood. Um, but it wouldn't be a natural pattern. In Latin, we can say puer fructum carpit. The emphasis there being on the boy. The boy picked the fruit. We can say fructum carpit puer, that the boy picked the fruit. Emphasis on fruit as opposed to picked up the um, apple. No, not the apple. Apple is fruit. He picked up the um, broccoli on the table. No, fructum carpit puer. He picked up the fruit, not the broccoli. Or we could say fructum puer carpit. Um, and uh, so fructum carpit puer fructum puer carpit. Here the, the emphasis in Latin is on the first word in the sentence and on the end of the sentence. And the um, the emphasis sort of runs inwards like this. So we have the first word high emphasis, the next word in less high emphasis, and the last word emphasis. So the verb can go at the end, but not always. Uh, the verb can go in the middle, at the beginning, that wherever the, the, the Romans can move, move these things around. So Latin allowed great subtleties of emphasis, and we can't really do that in, in English. And it's very hard to translate Latin into English for this reason, um, because the subtle gradations of emphasis that were possible in Latin cannot be transmitted into the English language, um, although the base meaning can. Um, in each of these Latin examples, puer fructum carpit, fructum carpit puer, and fructum puer carpit, which we translate as boy fruit picked, um, fruit picked boy, and uh, fruit boy picked. Um, in each of these three Latin examples, the same words um, with the same meanings are used, written in different orders. In Latin grammar, the sentences are the same, although the emphasis has changed. If you do this in English, however, the sentence is rapidly reduced to nonsense, unless you're writing poetry. Uh, say, Alexander Pope, uh, pleasures the sex as children birds pursue, still out of reach, yet never out of view. This is uh, the second epistle to a lady, um, 1743. A few curiosities of Latin, there is no article, the, a, and an, and, no matter what people tell you to the contrary, there are no words for yes and no. Um, you make a statement in the positive or the negative, and the I know that uh, people that speak nowadays um, want to have a yes and a no because it exists in English and other languages, and so they say itast, ita est, um, or minime. Um, but the Romans would not do that. That's not generally how they did it. If they want to say yes to something, they would just repeat the verb or the principal thing. So, do you have the book? I have. Um, right? That's how a Roman would say yes. So they would say, do you have the book? Yes. No, the Roman wouldn't say yes. He would say, do you have the book? And he would respond, I have. So, botany and Latin. Um, Latin is a... Uh, a language that can be used for describing new taxa under the International Code of Nomenclature for Algae or Algae or Alge, depending on how you pronounce your Latin, Fungi or fun, Fungi or depending on how you pronounce your Latin, and Plants. In this I'm going to be using the restored classical pronunciation as this is the academic pronunciation of Latin. So Algae, Fungi and Plants. Um, and of course, uh, the old English pronunciation of Latin, which is now pretty much extinct, is often used by botanists. And so you say fungi, um, and algae, right? But um, that pronunciation scheme, the old English pronunciation scheme of Latin, um, is pretty much extinct. I think there are one or two teachers still using it at Winchester School, but elsewhere 
it has vanished into the ether. It has shuffled off this mortal coil. And that is why in England we use the restored classical pronunciation, which has superseded the original native English pronunciation scheme. Um, so, we need Latin to understand texts written in Latin, and there are many botanical texts in Latin. Many botanical theses were written in Latin right up until the early 1900s. Um, and many of these have no translation into any other language. And Latin can help us know plants if the epithet is descriptive and hence to apply that name. So if our plant has white flowers, um, then we can be reasonably sure it's not a species with the epithet coccineus. Coccineus meaning scarlet in color. It's a great language, of course, and it can help in understanding English grammar and the origin of a great many words, not only in English, but also in other Romance languages. Um, and, of course, Latin now doesn't belong to any country at all, so it's impartial. Um, it enables a reader anywhere in the world to understand a description or diagnosis, even if the accompanying text is in a language they cannot read. So if you're reading something in Russian and it's a botanical text, you can still read the botanical descriptions. Although it's no longer mandatory to provide a Latin description or diagnosis, um, it is important to understand the requirements that were in force previously, because all the historical material still uses Latin. So it's all very well saying you don't need Latin anymore to be a botanist. That's not the case, and it's not going to be the case for a very long time. So the International Code of Botanical Nomenclature, this is the Vienna Code, uh, McNeil et al. 2006, refers to Latin in four articles, Article 23, Article 32, Article 36, and Article 60. Article 36.1 says, On or after the 1st of January 1935, the name of a new taxon, this is algal, and all fossil taxa are accepted, must in order to be validly published, be accompanied by a Latin description or diagnosis or by a reference to a previously and effectively published Latin description or diagnosis. And Article 36.2 said, in order to validly uh, publish, um, uh, the name of a new taxon of a non-fossil algae uh, published on or after 1st of January 1958 must be accompanied by a Latin description or diagnosis or by a reference to a previously and effectively published Latin description or diagnosis. And Article 36.3 says, in order to be validly published, the name of a new taxon of fossil plants published on or after 1st of January 1996 must be accompanied by a Latin or English description or diagnosis or by a reference to a previously and effectively published Latin or English description or diagnosis. And then there's recommend Recommendation 36A.1. Authors publishing names of new taxa of non-fossil data should give or cite a full description in Latin in addition to the diagnosis. And these rules ceased to be effective on the 1st of January in the year 2012, but they still apply to names published between the dates cited and the 31st of December 2011. So at the nomenclature sessions of the 18th International Botanical Congress held in Melbourne, Australia, in July 2011, a decision was taken to allow new taxa to be accompanied by a description in either Latin or in English from the 1st of January 2012. And note that nowhere does the code stipulate that a description or diagnosis must be correct Latin, and examples abound of errors, some so serious that the diagnosis or description is actually nonsensical. Um, so, but then the good question is, if the Latin is nonsensical, is it actually Latin? Hmm, that's an interesting philosophical linguistic question. Article 23 of the Code explains how the names of species should be formed, and Article 60 explains the orthography and gender of names, and they can be formed only using letters of the modern Latin alphabet, which is, of course, the English alphabet. It's worth reading William Stern's Botanical Latin, and you can find that on archive.org for download as a PDF file. And I am uh, thinking of producing that as an audiobook as well. Um, and Stern apparently is, is a good read. I haven't read him yet. And uh, so, 
consulting a Latin dictionary or a Latin vocabulary. When searching for a word in a Latin dictionary, remember you have to look under the nominative singular of a noun. Um, a good dictionary to use online is a glossa, um, third way. So if you go onto Google and type in third way, glossa, G-L-O-S-S-A, Latin dictionary, you'll come up with it. It's a searchable online dictionary with predictive um, text and uh, it's a very good dictionary. So that will help you. The um, masculine nominative singular for an adjective, the nominative singular of a noun, often for the comparative forms of adjectives, and the first person indicative active of verbs. So you will see horizontal lines over many vowels, and these are called macrons. And they are placed there by modern editors to indicate the length of the vowel. But this is highly problematic because it also is used in some texts to uh, note the length of a syllable. And a syllable in Latin can be long, even though the vowel length is short. Um, and this is a whole separate issue of Latin pronunciation, which as a botanist, I wouldn't break your head over too much. If you want to acquire a good restored classical Latin pronunciation with an intuitive sense of vowel length, then you can go to latinum.org.uk and start listening to the massive audio catalogue there. Um, which I've been building up over the last 10 years or more. And um, you'll find that that will help you with your Latin pronunciation. Botanists do not put the macrons in um, because uh, botanists are not writing Latin poetry. And uh, as uh, was noted before, they're not that punctilious about good grammar, let alone pronunciation. And very frequently anyway, they're using the traditional English pronunciation of Latin, which pays no attention at all to the length of the vowels. In fact, the English system of accentuating vowel length is used, so you will say um, quasi in the English pronunciation of Latin and quasi in the restored classical. So quasi versus quasi. So the parts of speech. Those that are needed for botanical Latin are noun, adjective, adverb, pronoun, preposition, conjunction and verb. You do have to know about what are called declensions, declining nouns, adjectives and pronouns. And there are five declensions. And you have to know about degrees of comparison, comparing adjectives and adverbs. And there are three degrees of comparison, although in practice only two are really used in uh, botanical Latin, the comparative and the superlative, because all plants, of course, are superlative things. So. We have to know about gender. Nouns are masculine in Latin, or they are feminine in Latin, or they are neither masculine nor feminine. They are neuter, or and some of them are common. They are both masculine and feminine. You have to know about number, that's singular and plural. And you have to know about conjugating verbs. This is distinguishing person, number, tense, and voice, and there are four conjugations. And Latin, of course, has many irregularities with words that are treated differently from others. And some people talk about how wonderful Latin is and how a scientific language it is, but like all languages, it is chaotic and irregular. Um, as a beginning student, um, you are exposed to the regularities, and so you get a false idea of how wonderfully scientific and mathematical Latin is, but it ain't the case. Sorry to disappoint. Um, you don't have to learn anything by rote when you're learning botanical Latin. Um, and parts of speech, etc., are always indicated in a dictionary or a vocabulary, and the declensions and conjugations and genders, etc. Um, but of course, the more you know, the easier it is to be a good botanist in terms of this aspect. So that's the introduction to uh, botanical Latin. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you go on to archive.org and type in botanical Latin, you will find some useful texts there. Um, including this one, which is by Short. Um, this is my interpretation of it, as I'm turning it into a little video for you. So that's the uh, introduction to um, this overview of botanical Latin. Bye. Oh, before I go, remember latinum.org.uk um, for all of my wonderful audio resources and my extensive thing and also if you want to um, support this YouTube channel 
You can also go to latinum.org.uk and you can subscribe to Patreon uh, there. And that will support me here on YouTube, even though you make no use of the Patreon. But of course, I do encourage you to use the audio materials there um, at Patreon, but you're not obliged to. Um, if you want to support me, um, you can click subscribe here and you can go over there and subscribe at Patreon and become a supporter. Bye. Voilà.